Good morning and welcome. My name is Dorothy Peterson. I'd like to welcome everybody here today, both here in the sanctuary and those of you at home. All children are invited to join Sunday School and the Children's Message. Um, you can pick up your children after church in the upstairs children's area. And if you're visiting, Pastor Aaron would love to meet you. After church, join us for some fellowship in Dobbs Staff Hall, which is located that way as you uh, exit the sanctuary. And also take note of the exits, including this one, more newly marked, over on the right here. Um, I invite you to let us know you're here by signing in on the registration pads, those blue pads at the end of the pew. Fill those in and pass it down. And if anyone would like to share a joy or concern to be lifted up at prayer time, fill out a prayer card, looks like this, and the ushers will collect them uh, during the first hymn. Prayer requests can be made public or private. Just a few things coming up at St. Matthew. Um, the Easter egg hunt is scheduled for March 16th at 10 a.m. sharp, and everybody's invited to attend. You can invite your neighbors and friends, and after the hunt, visit with the Easter Bunny and have some treats. She's excited. <laughs> the adult ed program uh, continues on Mondays through March 18th at 7 p.m. in the parlor right over there. Pastor Aaron will lead discussions to unpack the topics of our Lenten sermon series, This Is My Body. It's been a really good, um, informal and informative uh, discussion. I've been to a few of those, so please join us for that. And uh, Maundy Thursday dinner is pretty much right around the corner, and we're going to do the same thing we've done for the past couple years, which is have everybody sign up to bring a, a soup or a stew or a salad or a dessert, and there's a sign up uh, on the back. You do not have to bring something, but if you are so inclined, um, please sign up so we have a feel for how many people are gonna be coming for that. Again, don't feel like you have to bring anything, but if you do, please sign up. Oh, and even if you're not gonna bring anything, sign your name up just so we know how many people are coming. Um, I think that's about it on the announcements. I did notice there's still some Easter eggs to be filled out there, so if anyone is so inclined, please uh, pick up some Easter eggs to fill. And now, as we join with our sister United Church of Christ Churches, we say no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. stole in the hope that greenery is coming. Spring has sprung forward and we've lost an hour of sleep. Bless you all for being here on time. Please join me in the responsive call to worship found in your bulletin. Draw as close as you dare, children of God. Press into community and fellowship. For Christ is found not only in solitude, but in the noise and chaos of the crowd. Draw close and press in, for together in worship we truly become the body of Christ. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. There is a time to find God by ourselves, and a time to find God together. We gather as a community of saints to praise and worship our God in unity. Come, let us worship. Let us continue with our opening hymn. Now and we 
shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Not just in building small and confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place, the new light is shining. Now is God present, and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bones. God, we come before you grateful for another week, grateful for all that we've come through to get to this moment. And we thank you that you continue to teach us through the stories, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus. May we be transformed. May our hearts be enlivened by the words that we hear and the songs that we sing this day and every day. Amen. This is the season of Lent, and so we do confessions together. Um, please join me in the responsive confessional found in your bulletin, and probably as well on our screens. Let us confess our sins of trespassing boundaries together. Holy and righteous God, you taught us to treat one another as we would like to be treated and to honor one another. Therefore, we believe in bodily autonomy, consent and privacy because, because we know you have endowed each person with the, with the right, right to decide how close or how known they want, they want to be. But we, have, we not have not always respected bodily autonomy, consent, and privacy. God, we have trespassed boundaries. Please forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. May we learn to love each other better and more carefully, amen. Let us take a moment to let those words sink in. God, we thank you that you hear us, and before the first sorry or thought or worry is out, out of our mouths, you have already forgiven. You see us as loved. You see us and call us beloved. May we continue to know that as we confess what we need to confess. May we be assured of your never-ending, steadfast love for us. May we feel it deep, deep down in our souls. May it be so. Amen. So before we go to the passing of the peace, I wanted to let you know that we extended our invitation for the Ramadan dinner. I send out a special email. It's f March 20th, in my head, yeah. Um, it's a Wednesday night, I know, so it's hard for choir and for music who are rehearsing. But if you have not been to a breaking of the fast Ramadan dinner, it is so wonderful and lovely. I think there's about eight of us going now, maybe 10. If you would like to go, there's still time today to sign up. Please let Ken and myself, or you can sign up in the back. Um, it's going to be a meaningful time. This is the time where we show up for our neighbors, our neighbors of different faiths. And I think it's a beautiful and moving time. So I hope you'll join us. I think it's a good thing to do in Lent anyway. So as you pass the peace, as you give your holy hello, tell everyone what you will be doing on March 20th. If it's not the Ramadan dinner, <laughs> say hello to your neighbor.
So today we are going to unpack two scriptures in the Gospel of Luke, um, of Jesus interacting. We're continually still in the sermon series, This Is My Body, where we're focusing on Jesus, who he was, what he did, um, maybe some of the ways he modeled health to us. I wanted to unpack a little bit for you the Gospel of Luke. Um, most likely the author of this Gospel is a doctor or a friend or a missionary of Paul's that is mentioned a few times in the Pauline epistle or his letters. It is believed he wrote both Luke and Acts. So whenever anyone says trivia wise, if you're in a trivia game and they're asking who wrote most of the New Testament, people usually say Paul, right? Because he wrote lots of letters. But actually the most verses written by any author was Luke. He wrote Luke and Acts. Uh, much of the early writings confirm this as the style is very similar, the thematic elements are very similar, and they kind of flow through both of these books. Um, the timing is probably anywhere between 60 AD and 90. Um, it was intended, these books, to be distributed widely among the early church at the end of the first century. The audience for these books are probably Gentiles or a mixed audience because they are often reminded of historical things of Jesus, the call of gospel to be generous, and the Jewish roots that Jesus shared. Oftentimes you'll find us during these seasons, these liminal seasons in the book of Luke because Luke has a decidedly pastoral approach to stories and the accounts of Jesus. This gospel begins and ends and bookmarked by the journey to and from and through Jerusalem. So the idea of movement and journey is very much a thematic part of Luke. You'll notice in our stories today, coming and going, this town, on his way to something else, he stops. And we get to kind of see the ways in which he moved through the world, journeying both spiritually, right, and then metaphorically, but also literally, walking through towns. So table fellowship, healing, Establishing the connection of temple fellowship are all a part of the Luke-Acts narrative. And also a focus of Luke is the kingdom of God being one that goes out and stops and cares for the marginalized. So I hope you'll see that in these readings. Once, when he was in one of the cities, a man covered with a skin disease was there. When he saw Jesus, he bowed his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately, the skin disease left him, and he ordered him to tell no one. But go show yourself to the priests, and as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing as testimony to them. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds were gathering to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Meanwhile, he would slip away to deserted places and pray. The second reading. Jesus then came there, oh, just then, there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and began pleading with him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her money on the physicians 
No one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched him on the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming in on you and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone from me. When the woman realized that she could not remain hidden, the, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Do not, do not trouble the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he replied, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be saved. It's time for our children, our young and our young at heart, to come forward. I always like to say young at heart because Julie comes forward. She's very young at heart. Oh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. A good crowd today. I know. I'm so excited. And welcome back. It's good to see you. Hi. Good to see you both. All right. So um, has anyone ever been hugged? Yes? Have you been hugged? Before, yeah, maybe once or twice by a couple of people that maybe love you or something like that. Okay, do you want to sit here? We're all stretching. Okay, um, how does it feel when you're hugged? How does it feel when you get hugged? Does it feel good? Yeah, what else does it feel? Warm. Yeah, good. What does it feel? Happy. Right, happy? How about, um, so warm and soft and happy? Does anybody feel like relieved when someone hugs you? Like yeah. you're just relaxed? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do, right. And it, it makes you feel good, right? When someone hugs you for really any reason, right? When you get a hug, you feel warm. Now, what does it feel like when you hug someone else? How does that feel? It feels the same things? Yeah. It does? Okay. I feel like it's kind of feels special because that's like you're the one giving the hug, you're not the one receiving the hug. It's kind of like a gift. Oh, oh yeah. Like, I see the connection. Did you guys hear that? So Miranda is saying that when you give a hug, it's really special. It's kind of like a gift that it makes you feel special, doesn't it? Yeah. Did I say that right? Okay. Yeah, so what are you thinking? You're thinking it good. feels good to give a hug? Feel better when you like give a gift to someone else rather than when you receive a gift. Yeah. Yes, giving you feel better than receiving. Oh, that's true in so many things in our lives. So it both of it feels the same, but it does feel a little bit more special when we give the hug and we're touching um, someone else by giving them a hug. Very interesting about how it feels when we get hugs and how it feels to give hugs and how we give warmth and we give love. How about when you get a hug, does it feel safe? Do you feel safe when you're hugged? Yeah, yeah you just have that, that safe feeling. Um, like when, when you're sad and somebody oh. gives you a hug, yeah. you feel like you're better than Right. Yeah. And does your body just kind of go, relax because someone is caring for you and giving you that hug. Very nice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and pray. I love giving hugs. So just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> we need a hug. God, we are, we're going to pray, but it's okay. Wait, no. hey guys, God, come back. You, it's okay. Wait, God, you are yet. good and you are gracious <laughs> and we are all give consent for our bodies to be hugged, to give a hug. Um, as I like to say, your body, your choice, God, and may we be reminded 
that the ways in which we um, show our love as like a gift, I love that, um, and, and be reminded of that. May we learn a little bit more this day about the ways in which Jesus modeled love. Amen. Okay, all right, now we can go upstairs. All right. I love it, they're just so excited. They're like, we're done, let's leave, I love it. I don't take that personal at all. <laughs> sure. um, I love that. We always learn a little bit from that. I think um, to learn about what the kids are going to learn about is to learn about what it means to choose to hug someone, right? And to choose to give them a gift of your time, your space. Um, but it's also good to remember that um, we get to choose that, right? Whether we receive that or not. I usually ask if you notice, especially with kids I don't know, I ask first before I hug them. Is it okay? Would you like a hug? Um, and so we are reminded today that even Jesus had boundaries. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the lessons that you will teach us this day. Lessons that our world needs to hear, that we need to hear in our hearts. May you um, change us and challenge us and continue to give us good conversations about all the ways in which we learn from Jesus the good things about your love. Amen. So. If someone says, I'm exhausted, I'm so busy, I am so stressed, do you identify with that? Have you said any of those things this week out loud? I'm not gonna make anyone raise their hand. I'm not gonna call you out in that way. Um, that's, those are pretty common things to be heard in our society, aren't they? Pretty common things that we hear a lot of. Um, I think they often sometimes seem like badges of honor um, I've worked before with people who would consider themselves sort of workaholics, and while I think they thought that was a good thing, I sort of was like, isn't the olic at the end of it letting us know that maybe, maybe we need to have a little more work-life balance? Um, I think sometimes we in our culture lift up things that we need to unpack a little bit and challenge ourselves on a little bit. And so one of the things I've long admired about the stories of Jesus as we enter into this deeper understanding of his purpose, which often conflicted with the powerful religious leaders of his day, Jesus conflicted with culture of his day. Um, and that conflict, as you noticed, caused him no internal stress or worry. When the leaders didn't agree with him, he went, okay, right? And he kind of moved along his way. In the stories today, we are learning about how he healed people, how he healed the sick even on the Sabbath, how he ate with sinners, right? What he did with his body was unusual for rabbis, teachers, and leaders of his day. Last week, we were reminded that concerned about his ministry and jealousy of his popularity were things he knew and understood about and were aware of. And notice how he never catered to the Pharisees. Right? He never catered to the Pharisees. He never catered to the most powerful. And I wonder if that teaches us something. While he was popular, popularity was not his goal. I'm going to say that again. While Jesus was popular, popularity was not his goal. We live in a world where popularity and power are hot commodities these days, right? And so did Jesus in many ways, right? Um, and I've always struggled to be honest with these passages associated with healings, physical healings. Are they literal? Are they figurative? How exactly did the healings take place? What is the purpose of Jesus healing outsiders and outcasts? What are these stories? Have you ever come to some of the healing narratives and you're like, that's not real. That, you know, that really, maybe did that happen? I'm not sure if that happened. Um, you are not alone. Your pastor also feels that way. You're welcome for the commission to kind of live in that liminal space where we're kind of figuring out what all this means together. It seems in these two stories anyway, of three healings and a fourth on its way as you end, um, well, we don't get, again, the story of the healing of um, the synagogue leader's daughter, but she will be healed, right? We, there's a story of the dead girl that comes back alive. That's that story that will come next in this series, uh, but not in our sermons. 
There's one universal truth that I think overrides all of this as we question and think about what these healing stories mean for Jesus, is that sickness and pain do not discriminate between the outcasts and the powerful. Sickness and pain do not, does not discriminate, right? While there's ways in which sometimes those with better resources and those who are more powerful can get access to things other people can't, for the most part, the ways in which we struggle are universal. What unites us, what, and what unites an untouchable outcast with leprosy, a woman of no means groveling on the ground touching Jesus, and a powerful religious leader with someone in his family who was dying, what do you think unites them all? In this, in this instance, desperation. You, did you feel the desperation in the story? Come heal this person. I touched, I was so needing of healing, I touched you. I have leprosy, no one wants to touch me. I wanna be healed though. The other thing that unites them is faith in Jesus, that they would somehow be healed in some way. In no other room would you find these sorts of characters, these three unique characters, in agreement about much of anything, but here they are in our stories, all three at the mercy of Jesus, and notice that he treats them all the same. The story of the healing leper was an incredibly important one to my last church, my last church which was pr primarily LGBTQ folks. They have a very visceral and tangible memory of the AIDS crisis, right? And so stories of leprosy and touching were very much um, ones to unpack in that community. COVID, COVID triggered much of that, right? Um, what can I touch? What can I breathe into? Who is infected, right? All of those fears. And Jesus honors those who are met with fear and loathing and are seen in our society as unworthy. Jesus touches, heals them, and loves them. And so what is healing again, literally, right? Is it anecdotal? Is it true? I read through theologian Jürgen Moltmann, who was at my seminary and still writes books to this day, he helped me through this, he helped think through this this last week. He says this, of the writings and the healings found in Luke, he says this, Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world, no. They are the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. Healings, Jesus' healings, are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. No, they are the only natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. So healing, in fact, isn't the elephant in the room, isn't the thing that is weird in a rational world. Sickness is the thing in the room that shouldn't be there. Disconnection from God is what is out of place. Disconnection from each other is what's out of place. Redemption and healing and connection are the things that Jesus simply tries to normalize again. Jesus isn't doing anything new. He's revealing the ways in which our world has robbed us of joy, of connection, of health, right? Healing isn't out of step with a, na a rational worldview. Healing is a tangible sign that God is putting the world back together. And whether that healing is miraculous or carefully crafted, crafted by scientists, doctors, and nurses, can I get some snaps for scientists, doctors, and nurses? It is something that reveals how the world is supposed to be. When you are healed, right? When sickness is overcome, when you get to the end of a month-long coughing fit, that's happened to several of us, right? This fall, this, this last kind of winter has been wild. When you get to the end of it, it's revealed in your breath how the world is supposed to be. So healings, in a sense, reverse that curse, reverse the initial way that we've experienced the world, right? Through pain and suffering, healings set things right again. Healings are what makes sense in a senseless and difficult world. And I love how he is undeterred by other people's timelines or criticisms or their expectations of who he's going to heal and when he's going to heal. Last week I reminded us that faith should feel like relaxing. 
we talked about with the hugs. Like face should feel like a warm hug, like we're relaxing, like we're safe, right? Faith isn't tensing up to do everything perfect and right and people please, pretending we have it all together. No, faith is being reminded that God loves us and we are around the people who love us well. We can relax and be our full selves. Faith is found in the way that we can live out freedom. And I think no one exemplifies that better than Jesus. He honored all people equally and lifted up the lowly. And he did so without the push to be popular or overwork himself in the process. Notice how after he heals in the first story, what does he do? He goes away to pray and be on his own. He goes away to pray and be on his own. And after he heals that man with leprosy, which could be actual leprosy, which there's a name for it that I should know, but it's off the top of my head. Any skin disease is what they were calling leprosy. Anything that they didn't understand, right, back then. You didn't touch. You just left them alone. Notice how he sends them him back to the synagogue. He reconnects him with church. He doesn't say, well, now you're with the group of Jesus people. No. He sends the person back to the synagogue. And notice while he's on his way and someone reaches out and touches him, he doesn't just let that pass, that moment pass by. He stops and wants to know who has done that. And that, I think, brings us an important point about advocacy. We can advocate for ourselves, which is what the title of today's message is, Jesus advocating for himself. But in doing so, you must advocate for others. Advocacy is all connected. I mean, imagine being that woman in that second story. You are a woman who can't be healed in a world full of ancient misogyny. There's also modern misogyny and deep superstition. So you know that back then, thousands of years ago, sickness wasn't just sickness, right? It sometimes said something about your character if you were sick. Now we still have a little of that stigma today, right? I brought up AIDS, right? We still have some stigma when people get sick. For the most part, it's a little bit different, but still. Notice that she doesn't break. She still is hopeful. But what must her life have been like? So think about the man with leprosy. Think about the woman who was bleeding and couldn't find healing. What must those people have been called by society? How must they have been treated by society? And yet they both still have hope. She had hope enough to reach out to Jesus. And Jesus stops. He could have kept going, right? So I told you at the beginning, the, the idea of Luke and Acts is one of journey, like journeying through. Jesus goes to different towns and meets different people. He could have kept going. Why do you think he didn't keep going? He could have let her have a private moment, let her be healed. Why do you think he doesn't? Have you ever thought about that? I think he doesn't do that because I think, first of all, we need to be reminded that when something happens between two people, we need to acknowledge it. He, he wanted to see who she was. He didn't want her to be some stranger randomly he would never see again. And also think about the things she probably had been called. Think about the ways in which people thought of her as someone who couldn't find healing. Maybe she didn't have the means to find healing. Maybe she was poor. Maybe she was stigmatized for whatever reason. Maybe she was seen also like the leper as untouchable. He stops. And what does he call her? Daughter. He calls her daughter and he says, your faith has saved you. He doesn't say, aren't you so lucky? You touch Jesus. Did you know you're touching Jesus? I heal people. I'm awesome. Have you seen my TikTok videos? The healing ones? They get a lot of likes. They get a lot of shares, right? No, he lifts her up. In a world that maybe called her all sorts of things or dismissed her out of hand and called her nothing, he calls her daughter and lifts up her faith. Imagine how that changed, how the people looked at her, not just the healing part, right? There's two healings going on in these stories. There's the physical healing, and then there's the reconnection with society, because when we are diseased, right? Diseased comes from the phrase, we are dis at ease. Did I just blow your mind? <laughs> we are dis at ease, we're not eased, we're not comfortable in our own skin, in our own bodies. When we are diseased, when you are sick, what happens? You stay in your house, you disconnect from folks. What happened during COVID? 
and, and for very good reason, but we were all, dis who felt disconnected during COVID? Who felt like, I, I can, the TV thing, thank you for being here, but like if I can be in person somewhere and hug someone and look at someone, I wanna do that, right? We felt disconnected. Now technologies helped us out, technology they didn't have, right? The woman bleeding couldn't have got on her Bible study on Zoom, you know, or maybe she could have, I don't know, we weren't there, but no, she couldn't have, there was no Zoom back then. There was no Wi-Fi. Imagine though, that disconnection, how you feel alone and isolated. And in both those scenarios, Jesus heals people who are disconnected, dis at ease with themselves and the world. And then what does he do? He reconnects them. There's two healings going on. There's the physical healing, but I think for them, the much more important healing is the cultural, societal, community healing. That he brings them back and has them go and tell people or show and lift her up. You can love these people again. You can hug these people again. You maybe, imagine someone who has leprosy. Imagine someone who was phys had a physical ailment for years and years and years. How often did they get hugged? How often do they get touched? How often do they get treated, right, well? So I think that's powerful, right? I think Jesus exemplifies the fact that he is very aware at each and every moment what he's doing, and he does it in the most powerful way possible, and yet he also has good boundaries and gets away when he needs to. That's what we talk about today. Jesus had good boundaries. Jesus knew how to advocate for himself. The phrase that goes around a lot in memes on social media is, you can't please everyone, you're not a taco. <laughs> or put in, maybe for Chicago, you're not a pizza. Right? You're not a margarita. You can't please everyone. But with humor, there's always a sprinkle of truth. You can't be all things to all people, but you can be who you're supposed to be for the people that are put in your path. You can't be all things to all people. You can't be all things to all people. Do you hear that in your soul? Does someone need to hear that again? You can't please everyone. You can't be all things to all people. I think sometimes we try. Right? But you can be who you're supposed to be for the people who are put in your path and in your life. And those are the people that matter. An article is going around that lifts up this idea of let them. Have you heard that? The new self-care thing, you know, these things go around. And I feel like this article really models this well, um, this week what we're talking about. The idea is if someone that you don't know very well, maybe on social media or in a social situation that you don't know of very well, says bad things about you or doesn't like you or goes on and on about you in a way that's painful or whatever, like something that doesn't affect your life at all. When they do that, you let them. I think so often we try to control people by our behavior, even our good behavior. We do things because we want something. We want to make sure that someone is a certain way and so we manipulate and control. And notice that Jesus didn't do any of that. Right? He didn't try to make the Pharisees like him. He didn't hear the like, Pharisees were jealous. They didn't like him. They were questioning everything. He didn't go to the Pharisees and like have a debrief and like a sit down and go, okay, Pharisees, let's have a talk. Because it wouldn't have worked anyway. Let them. It didn't bother him at all. Let them. Many people think it's a bad idea to touch a leper. Let them think that. Some people think a destitute woman in pain is a lost cause. Let them think that. The rich people think you are not getting to the important man's daughter fast enough. He was important. Did you notice that? Synagogue leader? Jesus on the way? Let them. Jesus advocated for himself by being fully present in each moment. Seeing who was around him and honoring them. Napping if needed, as we found out. Getting a drink at the well when thirsty. And healing when called and going away to recharge when necessary. His calling didn't call him to be all things to all people. His calling gave him permission to pull away from the crowds, to stop on the way to somewhere else, to heal in unexpected and beautiful ways. 
and people criticized him? And did he engage in that criticism? No, he just said, let him. Let him think that. Think about the freedom of that. Think about how you would relax around other people if you didn't necessarily need to have everyone think the best of you all the time because you can't control what other people think. Good leadership allows for collaboration. He, we call it discipleship. But it makes decisions and let naysayers talk and those who criticize do their worst. Jesus' good boundaries and advocacy for himself was not limited to the physical body of his time, but included his mental well-being. It included his mental well-being. And that's one of the things I'm concerned with in our social media society. I don't think social media is bad. I don't think computers are bad. Technology is what it is. And it reflects our humanity, the good and the bad of it, right? Sometimes technology connects us across vast amounts of time and space, and it's lovely. Having images come up and seeing people give birth from far away who I don't know, and I remember it, oh my goodness, and here they are, and I love all of that. But I think social media has also got us to this unhealthy point of feeling like we need to defend ourselves all the time, we need to be liked all the time, we need to worry about those things all the time. And I think if we look at this in one way, we're modeling, Jesus is modeling for us a way to move through our world authentic, authentically, right? So it's not saying don't care about people or what people think about you, but it's saying that there's people that are gonna do what they're gonna do. You can't really change them, so why try, right? Put your energy to the people that are coming towards you, the woman that's coming towards you, the leper that's coming towards you, the man who wants his daughter to be healed, your disciples. Save your energy for those sorts of people. Because if someone wants to spend their energy criticizing and they're not in the game with you doing life, let them, right? And so I hope that we've seen this model of Jesus, right? This model of Jesus, who not only healed along the way, stopped and honored people, connected people with one another, but also always connected himself back to God. Took those moments out, didn't let the naysayers bother him. What would our world be like if we all felt that sort of freedom? the self of freedom, to do what we know we're called to do. And if someone says, no, you know, we don't know, says something, okay. I'm glad you have that opinion. It doesn't affect me, right? Now, things should affect us, but not everything should affect us. And I think that's the point. There's certain people that affected Jesus, and those are the people that had faith in him, had hope in themselves, and cared about their community, and cared about their healing, and cared about each other. And Jesus went towards those people and said, daughter, son, my child, your faith has saved you. May your faith save you each and every day. Amen.
should have like a little cloth for these preaching moments. Um, we are at our moment where we share our prayers and concerns with one another, a community that prays together, stays together. I don't say that every Sunday, so you're welcome. Um, so we, one which I knew about, Rose, where's Rose? Rose, Rose uh, sister Shirley passed away um, on Thursday, prayers of comfort and peace, but most importantly, keeping her children um, in our prayers um, because she's concerned about um, uh, how their mental well-being is and how they're grieving. So we will lift that up. Uh, are there any other prayer requests that we want to speak out loud? Yes. Wow, a golf ball sized mass in his brain. What is his name? Do you know? His name is David. David, a co worker of yours. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's really scary. Anyone else have any prayer requests from near or far? Oh, that's right. So Tuesday, I believe, is um, Evie's surgery. Evelyn, hopefully you're, you are following her Caring Bridge story. Um, you all have been so generous. Um, we put together a care package. Thank you so much. It means so much to the family um, that we're thinking of them, and they have just felt the love. I think what our church does best is love people well, and they have felt it. So I know that I talked to Mary this week, and she sends her thanks for all the ways in which you've supported her. Any other last prayer requests or thoughts? Okay. Well, I'm going to pray for us. Um, and then we end together with the Lord's Prayer. Um, I know in our confession we said trespasses, and that probably made you all feel a little nervous. We'll stay with debtors for the Lord's Prayer. Um, let's pray. God, we do give thanks for that healing touch that you give us, the mystery of healing, the mystery of your love, which comes to us in tangible ways. God, may we learn from Jesus. May we learn how to maneuver in our crowd of life, knowing what you've called us to do, knowing what we can pass on by, knowing the ways in which you ask us to stop and heal ourselves by taking time away and time off, for giving ourselves permission to retreat um, and, and knowing when to go in head first to all the things that you've called us to do. God, we lift up those who are getting new diagnoses and fear in that. We lift up those who have passed away, their loved ones. May they find healing and wholeness as they move through their grief. I love the image today of the journey because that's really what all of these things are, is us walking with you, God, through our health journeys, through our spiritual journeys. May we continue to walk together as a community hugging and lifting one another up. And we will pray as Jesus taught his closest followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we receive our offering, be reminded this day that God is generous with us and with you. May you find comfort in God's love. May you find healing in this space. And may you find connection. Because I think if there's one thing we've learned from the stories, it is not just that healing happens, that it does. It's revealing the world as it's supposed to be, where we are connected and loved, and everyone lifts up those in our midst. So may we continue to do that as a community.
God, thank you for the symbol of generosity and grace and the ways in which you continue to be faithful to our community and the ways in which our community is so loving and kind towards one another. May we continue to show that through our generosity in all areas. May it be so. Amen. Please join me in the closing song. remember next week we are having waffle palooza will the waffles be green i don't know they may be maybe Ooh, maybe um and of course next saturday is our um easter egg hunt so so much going on next weekend please join us for that and as i send you off be reminded that jesus is the great healer and that healing is revealing the ways in which we are disconnected from ourselves our bodies and each other may you find 
the connection and healing and redemption that God offers each and every day. May you find it, live in it, and pass it along. In the name of Jesus, amen. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom.